Hello, and welcome to The Fool and the Philosopher. The Philosopher and the Fool. Happy New Year! Yes, Happy New Year. Yeah, it's a new year. Two years of pissing into the wind. Basically. As you said, <laughs> spitting into the ocean. Drinking from a creek. Yes. And we're gonna drink that sucker dry. In elaborate <laughs> on my point, I can't. <laughs> yes, we're going to drink the creek dry as um, the creek, the water is you listeners, and we're going to dry you up. So I don't think we talked about this on. Um, you wanted to go to go into animation, yes. for school. Yeah. Now on two minute papers, there is a video that came out recently, as the time of this, about a week or two ago, of. An a- of Anubis, uh, an animated Anubis, that you just tell where to walk, and an AI determines its animations. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's amazing. So, you, you still want to go into animation? Of course, it sounds really easy now. You just, like, draw the little line with the mouse, and you get to tell where it goes. It's like, can you do animation without all the... But just the fun stuff, you don't have to do all the But then the stuff. developers can just do it, like the game developers, they can just... Oh, I want you to walk along this path, done. Well, that's fine. I could be a game developer instead then. I just download the software and then it's really easy to make a game. Not many steps. So are you excited about AI coming to the aid of game development? Incredibly. So I was playing The Witcher today and there was a merchant Mm -hmm. and I clicked on him and he said, come one, come all. And then I clicked on him again and he said, come one, come all. And I was thinking, yeah, fair enough. You know, that's that's acceptable in video games. It doesn't make much sense if it was real life, but... What if I'd missed it the first time? I want to hear the exact same thing. So, you know, it's all good. Yeah. But then I was thinking, it's weird what we accept as we play video games. If someone was just repeating everything they said every time you looked at them, it'd be really weird. And I was thinking, uh, there's a game that came out recently called AI Dungeon, which is like a text-based adventure that makes it up on the spot for the player. And it's, it's amazing, the idea. It needs a lot of work, but the idea is incredible and you can have some really good runs with it. You could use a very similar system and there's probably ones today that would work because AI Dungeons trying to do something very complex but for something much simpler I think it would be fine. Mm-hmm. You could have it generate dialogue for citizens in a town. Like a clever bot is that what it's called? Um, no, those robots that talk to each yeah. other? Yeah so you could have like a clever bot but you'd say you're a merchant and yeah. you would have another one and you say you're a peasant or something. And you're a guardsman. So that would work I think that would work fine with today's technology. Yeah. The problem is, then you'd get rid of the voice acting. But there are AIs now that can, like, you give them like a five second sample of someone's voice, and then they can do that voice for any sentence in any language. And they can change the accent of that voice. Yeah. So that would be, so you use a combination of a few of those, then you have it generating new sentences constantly for the merchants, and it can generate... Um, and it can speak for them, and it, you you wouldn't really tell. So do you think voice acting is just going to become like you get like a good range of your sound bites, and then you just sell the rights to use your AI? I think you'd sell the rights to your voices. Yeah. So you would say like, here's my pirate voice. And then they get that sample, and then they can use their pirate voice. And then, like, hello, this is my noble voice. And then they're like, ah, you have your noble voice. I feel like um, for more in-depth voice acting, they like, for a while, anyways, we'll keep around voice actors. I also think that the thing you don't see when you see these demos is how incredibly expensive it is to yeah, and how long it takes to do this. The AI can do it, but it takes a very long time. Yeah. So I can't really see it being a thing until either the technology gets a lot simpler well, or computers get way more powerful. Yeah, you say that um, like in uh, terms speaking to AI, um, there was an AI that. Um, they wanted to imitate brain neurons firing. And so, like, they wanted to basically simulate a human brain as best they could. And so they made this super AI, like, huge computer running it. And um, it took, I think, something like 40 hours or something to composite. And then two seconds of neuroactivity went off. Yeah. Two years later, it took them 20 hours to get four seconds of, of neuro stuff firing. So that's like vast improvements. Yeah, it's still a long ways to go. But mm-hmm. I think 15 years from now, AI Dungeon is going to be like, it's going to be the Zork of today. Mm. 
like Zork back then was like, wow, they think of like every possibility and you can mm -hmm. type in whatever you want. And now we have like The Witcher and Breath of the Wild. And yeah. these games are so much more than Zork could have ever been, yeah. especially Breath of the Wild. But it, but the games in 15 years from now using the AI dungeon as a base, like here's here's my sort of timeline. AI dungeon, amazing start, not very well implemented. Yeah. Very hard to improve. Five years from now, it's going to take a very long time. They're going to be able to make it so it can keep track of the world, your inventory. It's still going to be text-based, but it'll keep track of everything. Yeah. It won't be the same developers. It'll be a new team that comes with some new cool technologies. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be like, okay, now we know what you look like. We know your, we can remember your name. We can build a map of the world. We know what's in your inventory. You can't use what's not in your inventory. It's going to be way better. That's five years. Another five years, they're going to start adding sprites to the game. Mm -hmm. So this, the sprites, five years from now, they're going to start adding sprites to the game. These sprites are going to be drawn by AIs. They're going to be little 16-bit sprites to keep, because the computer load's going to be massive. Yeah. You're probably going to have to play online on a server that goes to like a, a super computer server. Yeah, thing. well, it depends on like how long quantum computers take to develop. Yeah, so let's digress to quantum. Actually, no. Let's let's put a put a pin in quantum computers. I want to I want to talk about that a little bit actually. Yeah. Because, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'll get to that, and I hopefully won't forget my point on the quantum computers. So no, so after the so five years from now, we get the AI that is actually like a good game. Another five years, we get it drawing sprites and and um, reactive based on what you do. It's doing the dialogue thing. The worlds are full, complete. You say, like, I go into a room, and it's like, okay, let's draw some tiles here. Let's draw... Some... It'll look like... Um, Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> it'll look a bit better than Dwarf Fortress. It'll be like a Dwarf Fortress with a texture pack, or, yeah. like, a lot of indie roguelikes where they have they get the open rogue um, sprite pack or whatever it's called. Yeah. It'll be like that, but the AI will draw the sprites for you. So that's 10 years from now. 10 years after that, so I guess that's... 20 years now. That's so, 25 years. Yeah, so 25 years, or 20 years. 25? Yeah. 20. Something, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. Five years, five years, and then it's going to take ten. You're going to start letting it build, like, 3D spore-looking models. It's mm -hmm. going to be like playing Oblivion, basically. It's going to yeah. be like that sort of ugly, everything makes it looks like it's made out of putty. But it's going to be able to create 3D worlds reactively to whatever you do. And at the start of the game, you just type in some parameters you want, yeah. and you have any game you want. And it's, it's not going to be like the garbage of procedural generation. I, I say the garbage of that because... Procedural generation can actually be really boring. Yeah, it, it's very predictable. Yeah, whereas this is an AI that's uh, learning things, so it will actually flesh it out. Yeah, I think it'll still be a bit more predictable than like a story handcrafted by people, mm -hmm. but this stuff's improving very fast, so who knows? Well, what AIs of this nature, it's what, the past five years they've been developed? Yeah. Or less, like maybe the past four? It's, it's, uh, I think, I'd say, like, past 10. It's, okay, it's it started past, slow, but it's been getting... Still past 10, and, like, where they've started to where they've gone. Yeah. It's insane. So, 20 years from now, we're going to be playing Oblivion-like games, but in any world you want, and it's going to be a lot more flexible. Like, you can do anything. You're still going to have a text console, because there's not going to be enough controls, but it'll, it'll have some basic movement and stuff. Yeah. But you're going to be able to just say, wait a minute, no, I want to be able to dig here, and there's no dig function. I'm just going to bind my um the seven on my keyboard mm -hmm. to dig and i just type in dig and then it's like okay so whenever i press that it gives the ai the dig command mm -hmm. and it imagines me digging a hole there yeah and then you're like if i press seven my left mouse button becomes dig i press that the the ui for this thing is going to take a little bit of polish but i think we could design it now and it'd be fine it's just most of the people at the front of this stuff they're not the ones that are good at making UIs and yeah. everything. Like, no, Dwarf no, Fortress is No a kidding example. about, like, people at the forefront of technology don't understand UIs. Now, 20 years from now, we're going to have this system. But games keep getting better and better. Breath of the Wild being a great example mm -hmm. of, uh, of redefining what is possible in games, redefining the flexibility of games. Because they've become very, like, Assassin's Creed, let's say. When it first came out... It probably wasn't revolutionary, I'm not sure. But it was... The first Assassin's Creed game was a bit revolutionary. There's a lot you can do in it. You can climb, you can jump, you can you can kill just about anything. It's it's a pretty, it's a pretty like, cool... Like, it, it redefined freedom. You're not, yeah. you're not playing the original Zelda where you have to, like, move in, in square spots and you, your attack comes out at a very precise time and all yeah. the enemies move in little predictable paths. It's, it's like this... 
it's like at the time a living breathing world yeah. and then each assassin's creed since then has iterated upon the process and made it better and better and better more or less like the one game they add where you could start climbing trees and rock yeah. faces it wasn't yeah. buildings anymore it's everything and they make the worlds bigger and better and more beautiful. The graphics become better. You get more cool abilities. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The new games are huge. Like Odyssey, it's massive, all the stuff you can do. But it hasn't actually done anything new to expand your freedom. You can't punch yeah. down walls with your fist. You can't, no. like, there's nothing like that. Breath of the Wild changed the game for open world games. Yeah. And that's going to keep happening in the next 20 years. So, like Cyberpunk, they show that in a demo. The sh you can shoot through walls and slowly destroy cover by chipping away with bullets. That's like one of their features. Yeah, and um, that is like, uh, what was it? Red Faction War Dragon or whatever it was called? That game came out in like 2005 and you could do that. Mm -hmm. And there was a car racing game that came out in the 90s that you could do that fully destructible 3D environments. Yeah. It's kind of funny that we're just... I think we uh, started with... I want to say starting in 2015... We've started bringing back the stuff that was in games in the 90s. It's because we now have, like, the models kept going up, but then you couldn't do anything with these models. Like, you've seen those games that try to imitate Minecraft while looking good. Yeah. And they have varying degrees of success. Space Engineers seems to be the best I've seen. So. Yeah. Or um, Seven Days to Die really improved. Yeah. Um, oh, and The Forest actually does a pretty good job as well. Yeah. Like, they sort of have, like, their own ways of going about it, but, like, where you can actually dig in the ground, they'll slowly create a hole. Yeah. Like, they have varying degrees of success, where Minecraft's very simple. It's cubes. Yeah. And so... And Minecraft, the the it's not the graphics so much that does it, it's the way it stores its information. Yeah. The entire world is basically a very small 3D model, and mm -hmm. each... Um, it's voxel... It's called voxel-based. Yeah. A voxel is a 3D pixel, so yeah. it basically draws a picture using the whole world, and then it load, and then it says, "Oh, there's a green pixel at this position, so I will draw a grass block in yeah. our world." Yeah, and so it's like figuring out how to make these systems work as efficiently as possible, or just utilizing the upgrade power while keeping your graphics now. Yeah, so we're we're starting to bring back like. Uh, Phoenix Point is trying to yeah. bring back some of the stuff that made the original XCOM so um, complicated, and. What is it? Like I said, um, Cyberpunk is bringing back Vice City. Some, some things you could do in Vice City, which is, I believe you could actually like sh blow up buildings in Vice City. Right. Like it has certain buildings in certain areas, but Vice City had like more freedom than a lot of the newer GTA games. So I don't have much hopes for Cyberpunk actually yeah. being like revolutionary. I imagine yeah. it's just going to be... It's just going to be good for what its generation yeah. is. It's just going to be like another iteration on an older formula. Yeah. But... There's going to be more Breath of the Wilds out there. There's going to be more Super Mario Odysseys. There's mm -hmm. going to be more, I don't know, like Heat Signatures even. He kind of... He created something new. Yeah, it's not... More AI dungeons maybe, but, yeah. but, but not just in the AI category. So that's going to keep happening over the next 20 years. Yeah. From 2000 to now, we have had an amazing increase in games and understanding what makes games fun yeah even julian gollop didn't bring back a lot of the features from the first XCOM, and it's probably because he realized that a lot of them weren't necessary yeah like you like looking at a lot of numbers and having a lot of numbers but a lot of those like you had like eight to mm -hmm. ten stats in the original XCOM. yeah and you don't really need them like i like energy i think is actually good and it'd be kind of fun to keep and um he sort of has it with willpower yeah and they had uh hit points and reflexes and psi power and psi defense and psi yeah but he basically condensed it down though into three stats yeah and that's i think that's okay because well you might like the 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 high resolution gameplay you can get rid of most of it and focus your effort on other areas and make an overall better game, even if it doesn't have the, the little micromanaging bits that were very fun. And and that is kind of a dumbing down of the game, yeah. but I think it also lets you focus on the game's strengths. Yeah. If the game was based around leveling up your units, which the original XCOM kind of was, actually, to be fair, uh, in, in a way. So, yeah, it was based around like having your guy survive and level up. Yeah. So maybe they did need it. And I don't know if that was a good thing to get rid of or not, but you you, you see what was needed and what wasn't. Yeah. Like, I think, like, uh, uh, what, what is it? Lives. Mm -hmm. Those are disappearing. You don't really see that too often anymore. Yeah. 
And even games like Mario, they don't need lives. And some games like the new Rayman game, I believe, doesn't have lives. It's a platformer. Yeah. A co- um, what's it called? Celeste? That doesn't have lives. That's a platformer. Yeah, they've more figured like, oh, save point or checkpoint, and you just keep going from there. Yeah, because you, what are you going to do? You just have to redo the stuff you've already done? That's not interesting. Yeah. And you're not giving them quarters anymore. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. It's, it's no longer a quarter game. I think another one that's going to... Like, they're basically working off the original design, which a lot of video games that were successful were um, the putting a coin to play the game. Yeah. I think another one that's going to disappear is going to be encumbrance systems. Mm. Because, um, like, like the, the Witcher right now I'm playing, Witcher 3. Yeah. You can carry so much stuff, it's ridiculous, but there is an encumbrance system, so I think you might as well just get rid of it. Yeah. Now, the same with lives. Just because most games should probably get rid of it doesn't mean you can't keep them. It's just you have to make it matter. Like that, so if you were... Pl- um, is it Death Stranded, that new game, which is basically based around your encumbrance system? Yeah, if you base a game on it, then use it, definitely. Mm-hmm. Or if you're playing, um, like, NetHack or Ancient Domains of Mystery, yeah. every bit of gear you have makes you a stronger character. Yeah. So limiting your carry weight is actually limiting the strength of your character. And... It's not just by a small amount. It's like, if I can carry one more potion, I will do like 10% better because the carry weight is small enough that it really matters to get every little bit of extra weight you can. And also money is tight enough. You need to be able to carry as much like extra armor and stuff to sell Mm -hmm. that it all really matters. Yeah. So you need to either make the carry weight feel... Or Legend of Grimrock. Every item you have is a puzzle solving tool. Mm -hmm. And you can't carry that much. So it's a really... You have to either make encumbrance something you feel constantly, and not in like a Skyrim way where you're trying to suck up everything so you're just like, I sell it. Yeah. Although Skyrim, Skyrim's might be okay. But in The Witcher, I have, I have gathered up so mm-hmm. much rubbish, and I, I got to like 60% full of the carry weight. Yeah. I'm, I'm only early in the game, but still, I think you might as well just get rid of it. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe with your AIs in the future, though, like, they will start making shop AIs picky in, like, a way unique to each AI's personality, and they won't buy certain shit from you. Well, in my game, I think that'll, in that AI game 20 mm-hmm. years from now, that'll be fine, because you're going to get, um, if you want to go on a long journey across the desert, you're going to need to carry supplies, and so what you can carry will matter, so you might need to buy an ox and a horse. And yeah. So as long as the game uses every mechanic it has to a high extent then you should keep it in but if you're not using lives in an interesting way like mario might have troubles getting rid of lives at this point because coins are tied to lives i think the best thing mario could do actually well is do like super mario odyssey and and just um make coins for buying stuff instead yeah but if you want to keep like the 2d platformers i think you have to make coins um I don't know, like, give well, you new hats or something? Well, like, even Metroid um, Fusion new as levels. the old platformer, it got rid of lives. Yeah. Like, it always had hit points instead. That's what they did in the Metroid games, is your upgrades you'd find would give you more health ca- c- containers, and then you'd have save game points. And that's, like, a relatively old platformer. I think 2D Mario might have hit its limit, though, as well. Yeah. Like, Donkey Kong was able to... Like, Don- Mario Makers hit the limit. Yeah. Donkey Kong's another game that was actually able to break free. The Donkey Kong Country Turns series redefined what it is to be a 3D pl- uh, 2D platformer. Yeah. They made the levels dynamic, they made them interesting, they, you could bounce back and forth. Mm-hmm. They actually kept the 2D genre going in a way, I think, because they, they're they like, wait, you don't just have to... Like something like Super Meat Boy said, well, how about that we'll really focus on the technical side. Mm. But if you want to play like a classic Mario game that isn't just... Mm-hmm. Like Super Mario World still exists. If you can't make a game better than Super Mario World, there's no point. Yeah. So Donkey Kong Country Returns... I think is better because it doesn't their life system basically let you try to zerg rush their level. Um, their life system, I don't know if they need it, but at this, you there's so many generous checkpoints that mm-hmm. you can, and you can lose like thirty lives on a level. Yeah, it's actually a really hard game, so it does mean that you might have to. Um, and this is this is why I think lives are bad. If you want to beat a really hard level, you might go back and play the first world to get a bunch yeah, of lives. Yeah, farm ten balloon yeah. packs. But the nice thing about Donkey Kong is replaying worlds is actually really fun, at least for me, because yeah. there's so getting the Kong letters yeah. actually unlocks temples, and and getting all the puzzle pieces unlocks artwork, yeah. and so you want to gather them all because it's really fun to try to get 100% in Donkey Kong. Yeah, so you can go back and actually 
do something while gathering up your lives. Yeah. So so I think Donkey Kong is actually worth trying to 100%. So it is fine, but I still think... Well, they, maybe they need a way to limit you on levels, though. Um, yeah. and, and so what you're doing is you're saying, like, I invest this much of my gameplay before I try to get better to beat this level. Like, yeah. I invest 30 lives worth to get past this final checkpoint. Because there's checkpoints constantly. Yeah. So I think if they got rid of lives, they would have to reduce the number of checkpoints. Mm. But... But then you might get a case with Celeste, which is you slowly, like, cause yourself to go insane as you yeah. try to... Well, Donkey Kong is like Celeste, where there's really hard sections, but there's always a checkpoint after. Yeah. Like, Celeste is very generous with checkpoints, and it has to be, because yeah. it's such a hard game. Yeah. And Donkey Kong Country Returns is also very hard. Um, so maybe it doesn't... Ma I feel like Celeste even redefined lives. Like, instead of um, giving you lives, it gives you a little counter of how many times you've died, and it makes you feel a little stressed out, like, oh man, I suck. Well, I think that it's actually to show that how you overcame it despite yeah. that is their goal. I don't know yeah. if that... I, yeah, but for me, it's like I see, you've died 700 times in this game. It's like, what? So, so yeah, anyways, my point is games like Donkey Kong Country Returns, Breath of the Wild, Nintendo seems to be pretty good at uh, revolutionizing game. Yeah. They have for their entire, like, gaming existence, I guess. If only they could do that Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, well, that, Pokemon isn't bad, the new one. It's just, it didn't do anything. Yeah. Well, it was, it was pretty, like, they didn't really try yeah or at least or one theory i heard is that they were just super rushed which mm. i could see like yeah. that because they have it did you know pokemon is the greatest um is the biggest selling media ever they like, mm. just ever it's bigger than any movie it's bigger than any book it's well, bigger than any tv series well it's i'm bigger. curious but how much time was like between um red and the game that came after it um i don't know because, like, how much time is there now between, like, Sword and Shield and the ones, like, a year? Yeah, maybe two? they're doing, like, one or one every year or two, yeah. Yeah, like, maybe they should step back and, like, maybe take two or three years to do or one. Or your Pokemon, double the size of your team, <laughs> quadruple the size of your team. Yeah. Like, okay, your job is animations on Pokemon. Yeah. Your job is game design. My job? No, all ten of you. Your game design. We have all, we, we make more money than any yeah. other thing on, any other media on Earth. Well, even then, though, like, also take a little more time with game design. Yeah. Because... I think their game design was actually decent for this well, last like one. like, Metroid, like, that, it has a huge team. I've looked at their team. They have a lot of people working on the newest Metroid game. And the guy in charge of it is like, no, we need to take more time. We need to step back and redo this whole thing. Yeah. And so, it needs to be more like Other M. <laughs> so, um, the games are going to keep innovating, mm -hmm. keep getting better. So, by 20 years from now... This Oblivion game is going to be amazing, but there's going to be a lot of games better than it because yeah. they're going to be handcrafted and people are going to be getting so good at it and they're going to be using... The AI is also going to be using like the, the AI moving things. Yeah. Like AIs are going to become huge. You're going to be fighting a, like like algorithmic AIs. In, You're going to be fighting the black and white enemy. You're much better than yeah, that. Yeah, but I'm just the basic idea of that, what that was, like the revolution. Like, there's AIs now that can beat top StarCraft players. You're going to yeah. be playing against those. They're going to be limited and dumbed down, but you're yeah. going to be fighting those in games. There's already a game, uh, RTS, that was released with one. Its name's Boris, and mm. it you can fight... Oh, yeah, Boris, right. And it feels like you're fighting a real like, human. Yeah. And there's going to be more and more of these. Like, there's the uh, Amiibos on the Switch. Mm -hmm. uh, or on the Wii U. Like, yeah. there, th there's going to be more and more of those. So... The pure AI game that I'm thinking of isn't going to be the best game, but people are going to be like, wow, imagine if you polish this up a bit. And it's going to slowly close the gap. And I think another 10 years after that, so 30 years from now, mm -hmm. you're going to have the game that's finally better than most of the games on the market. And then the games market's going to crash because there's no point on making games anymore because this AI can just through random chance make better games than you. <laughs> And then the goal is going to be to make your own variants of it. Yeah. You're going to take. The, you're going to try to make your own system with better variants, better ways it interprets commands. Yeah. And then what's going to happen is you're going to throw this in VR. Yeah. Or say like this is also all dependent on what VR is doing while this is all happening. So that's holodeck in like forty years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe less. Wow. And that isn't like a crazy timeline. I think no. it could be a lot faster. Well, yeah. Like think about like just video games. Just video games. What we've what people have done in the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. We like went, even the last 10 years, what we people have done with video games. Heroes of My Magic 3 to no game better than that still. <laughs> but I mean, just like innovation wise, yeah. like not 
like you can make a, a game like Lord of the Rings. There's better writing techniques now, but this is still a stellar book. Yeah, but at the same time, like games like Baldur's Gate, the original XCOM, Here's My Magic Two, Here's My Magic Three, there still hasn't really been games better than them. Like Divinity might be better than Baldur's Gate. Yeah, but it doesn't look as good. Like it, it's. It's a little no. bit plasticky and over, like, I don't know, saturated something. And, uh, like, it's hard to beat those old models for some reason. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's because 3D is just... Although Baldur's Gate, was it sprites, maybe? It was 3D sprites. I think it might have been sprites with, like, a bunch of different... Yeah, 3D yeah. sprites, that's what they're called. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, Baldur's Gate actually did something revolutionized as 16-sided sprites instead of 8-sided. Oh. It's hard to beat that sort of, like, hand-drawn care. Mm-hmm. Because... Like, Here's My Magic 5, for example, looks hideous. Mm-hmm. It's so ugly looking. It was so ugly looking, I couldn't play it when it came out because I couldn't figure out what was what. I was like, is this my castle or a tree? Or how do I how do yeah, I, how I, do I enter this mine? Wait, no, I just attacked a ghost. I thought that was a pile of iron ore. What's... <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so um, I don't know if 3D games are... I think... Like, there's also AIs that are getting really good at making 3D models. Yeah. And I think once we use those, we'll be able to have some pretty nice-looking games. Well, I'm excited for the ones that are getting good at 2D models. <laughs> that would be really cool. Because, like, that's one thing I've seen. Like, in, like maybe it'll be another, like, 20 years' time or whatever. But, like, imagine playing a video game that's also a painting. Yeah. Like, it looks like some Renaissance painting, and you're, like, playing David running around. and Yeah. Like, David painted by Leonardo so da Vinci or whatever. Yeah. Or, and he's running around and kicking people on the shins or something. <laughs> You're clubbing snakes and stealing apples. Yeah. Game bash from heaven. The other really cool thing to think about is, like I said, Baldur's Gate, really hard to top. Here's my Magic 3, really hard to top. But, uh, well, here's my Magic th- Heroes of Might and Magic 3 is a weird one. But uh, Baldur's Gate was Bioware, who was pretty big. And EA, eventually. Um... But you look at um, Pillars of Eternity, or you look at Divinity, or you look at... um, Well, those are the two big ones I can think of. Yeah. Those were not big AAA companies. Those Those were indie studios. You look at um, Chrono Trigger. You look at Final Fantasy, the original Final Fantasy. Yeah. Nowadays, people are sick of... Like, if you look at Steam... All that you can, half the games on Steam are RPG maker games. Yeah. And those are, like, there's a tool for it that you can make them super easily. Most of them, maybe none of them, are as good as Final Fantasy or Chrono Trigger. Yeah. But you can, but like anyone, I could, I don't know how to use RPG maker at all. I don't own it, but if I downloaded it right now, I could probably make a game fairly simply. And so think about, um, if Unity right now, you can make... Uh, a 3D racing game. Like, you you can make Mario Kart, like yeah. a very basic Mario Kart, pretty easily in Unity. Well, uh, you know Source Engine, right? Yeah. Vampire Masquerade was made in Source. Really? Yeah. Wow. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, a lot of games are made in Source that you didn't think they were made in Source. Yeah. So, actually, yeah, Source games, like Stanley Parable, that was just like a small group of people. They did Stanley mm-hmm. Parable. We're going to get to the, the... Oh, here's here's a big one. Um... Let's see, what would be... Ocarina of Time was made by Nintendo. Huge yeah. company. The Witcher 3 is made by CD Projekt Red. That has way more put into it than Ocarina of Time, and it's yeah. made by a much smaller company. Yeah. I don't know if their bu- their budgets might have been similar. I don't know, because games are so much bigger now. Yeah. But the fact is that it's basic, I think... Let's, let's, try to, let's try to figure out a rough metric. I think AAA companies can make a game... And then it takes X. So let, uh, I'll get your like input. So a, a AAA company makes a game. Well, let's let's do Breath of the Wild. Yeah. How many years before a non AAA game, ca- a non AAA company can make Breath of the Wild? Well, we know the answer to that. It's um, three because a Chinese mobile com- mobile game company is coming out with a um, Breath of the Wild clone this year. Mm-hmm. So it takes three years before a non AAA com- game. Before a non AAA company can, can make a triple A AAA game from three years ago. Yeah. So a two thousand decent sized company, like a two thousand twenty decent sized company, yeah. can make a two thousand seventeen triple A game. Yeah. How many years until an indie studio can do that? Uh, so let's go with 
um, well, what's an indie indie studio that did? Well, Oblivion um, made that new game. Oh, Obsidian. Obsidian, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Obsidian. Ob Obsidian. I mean, they're experienced, though. But... They're very experienced. They made Outer Worlds. Yeah. No, not Outer, Outer... Yeah, Outer Worlds. Which was like a one-fourth they... of the team that made New Vegas. Yeah. So they made Outer Worlds. They also did, like, Baldur's Gate and all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. Like, that's... Although Obsidian, who knows who they kept and lost, but... And um, that was... Let's see. And well, that's, they... like... So let's say that's New Vegas, which... Th that's, like, 10 years? Uh, no, yeah. 15 years? Yeah. Or even... They made a better 10. Fallout 4. 10. Yeah, maybe. I'd say it's better than Fallout 4. Yeah, okay. So that's that's like three years again? Yeah. But that is a very experienced company. Yeah. So people with a lot of experience and a lot of backers, yeah. an indie studio can do a AAA in three years as well. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at something like, let's say, Warcraft by Blizzard, like yeah. Warcraft 3, nowadays, there's like Flash games like that. Yeah. And so that's, that's, um, that's only like 10, 15 years where like... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So or it, was the Reforge team? It, it's going to take them like another year or two, I'd say. Yeah. But they're making a revolutionary. Yeah. Design to RTSs. I don't. Well, I think they're just. I don't know if it's going to be revolutionary. Well, no. What they're doing, like, um, they're modeling. Like, they're one of the few people who are making it in the RTS in the engine that they're using. Right. So th they're making it pretty, maybe, but I don't think yeah. they're going to redefine rts's in yeah. a way that makes people like wow why didn't everyone do this yeah but, but they're they're um they're making it very pretty which yeah might be to their detriment it's taking them forever but that's the nice thing about a fan project if it succeeds they don't mm -hmm. care about a time limit <laughs> yeah they don't have to make money you are listening to the fool and the philosopher so speaking of the reforge team and like incredibly slow iteration yeah let's go back to the quantum computers okay so you say maybe quantum computers will be big by then, like 10 yeah. years from now, 20 years from now, and that could change the rate of everything dramatically. Yes. It seems like every week I see like a... A new thing about quantum computers? New, but is that it? Like every week, one hurdle has been overcome of the billions that they... Like, if this was, if this was like computers, right? Yeah. Like, I bet you Intel makes like 100 improvements a day. I bet they're like, wait, we can do this smaller, we can do this, we can do this, and it's like... Okay, let's make it all we and Intel, they don't even have to like have like 500 geniuses working on a math problem for a week. They can just be like, you know, I think we have enough money now. We can afford a better like computer to uh, print slightly smaller, like a better like um, like um, needle or something. Yeah, like a smaller needle. And someone's like, hey, you hear about like uh, this uh, new alloy that you can make like the tips out of so that the nozzle can be like smaller. Yeah, let's just chuck that in there and see if we can get it smaller. Like they're doing stuff like that at Intel, I bet, and they're making they're they're like making like a ten percent more powerful chip every week. Whereas these people are like, okay, so one of those impossible problems, we we think we figured out a solution, but it's gonna need like five other really hard ones. Well, I think the thing with that though is the um, the quantum computer that they have, like the quantum computer air quotations that they have, um, people are like, oh, we actually found a use for it. They can do, like, basic addition or something, right? uh, No, it solved one of the problems that it had. Oh. They used the computer to solve one of the math problems with the computer to improve it. So, like, I feel like quantum computers are going to be a bit like Hex from Wheel Time. <laughs> Not Wheel Time, sorry. Uh, Discworld? Yeah. Because, like, I've heard things about them, like, they um, use dental floss as a component. Yeah. And they're using Lego bricks, bricks as an insulator. <laughs> Because they're the cheapest and best plastic they can get, like Lego bricks. Like, not even using the same kind of plastic as Lego and, like, custom printing it. No, it's just better for them to buy packs of Lego bricks yeah. and set them up. You know, they, they can't build a factory to have the same standards as Lego. Yeah. Because it'd be... <laughs> yeah. So, and so I feel like... I feel like the very first quantum computer is going to be this giant cantankerous beast that'll then tell people how to make a better one. Well, I think... I think quantum computers aren't going to be like that. I think they're going to be more like ENIAC all over again. Mm. They're going to be, like you said, these giant cantankerous beasts. Yeah. But all they're going to be good for is basic math problems. Mm. However, they're going to have like an incalculable amount. Well, lit they'll be able to calculate it, I guess. Yeah. They're going to have 
way more power than current computers, but they're only going to be able to solve math problems like um, Aristotle's math problem, which takes mm -hmm. a ridiculous amount of computer power to solve. Yeah. But they're going to be, so you'll be, you'll be like, what's the, um, what's like the largest prime number you can discover? And it's going to discover one or many orders of magnitude larger than the current record. Yeah. But it's not going to be able to like render images or anything for a long time. I think it's going to be very slow. But I think once they get a basic working model up, then they're going to be able to improve upon it. And but, once they develop a desktop for it and a mouse interaction. <laughs> well, once it's like right now, I'm, I feel like it's just like this. It, work, it, it works and then falls apart. I don't know if that's how it actually is, but I feel like it's probably really unstable. Mm. And you, but like the, the improvements I see, like they just successfully did some sort of quantum teleportation between two quantum computers. And no, that's that's quantum teleportation development. That's not even quantum. This, no, this is for quantum computing, though. Oh. It was saying. Okay. And and it's like, oh, wow, that that took a while. Like, I, I shouldn't be like down oh, on the pace of progress, but these computers are not coming. Oh soon. wow, that took a while. You teleported information. Yeah, but you teleported information. But it's pretty darn slow, isn't it? I'm sorry. They just teleported a few um, qu quartons, and that's not good enough for you. It, well, it's just not, we're, it's not that it's not good. It's just, I don't think we can rely on quantum computers improving computers anytime soon. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. And I think in, we're actually going to, uh, you think they're go we're going to make a super AI before a quantum computer? Well, that's kind of the problem is that this game I'm talking about will take so much power. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll be possible because computers, sh who knows? I feel like they should be hitting the end of their run soon. That's what the head of Intel said, um, more? like two years ago. Yeah, more. He said that like two or three years ago. He's like, computers aren't going to stop um, developing at the rate they've been developing. And then like a couple of days later, his company discovered a way to make USB sticks like a thousand times faster. Yeah. But st I still think he's right. I, I like he um, he was right about Moore's law, but it can't last forever. Moore's law was the accidental observation by him. And, and then he was like, okay, it's going to come to an end soon. And then his company discovered a way to make USBs a thousand times faster, which should be like, I wonder how long it is. I think it's five years when like it goes, it takes like five years for um, a discovery to be put into action yeah. and then to hit the commercial mark. Like that's going to be for like, you know, the military and yeah. like NASA, they're going to buy these USBs and then it's going to yeah. eventually hit the consumer market like another five, 10 years. So. It's Four years to hit the consumer market. Yeah. So so we'll say ten years from then. So like another seven years before we get like a thousand times faster USBs. But by that point, maybe we'll just use um, whatever system hard drives use to connect to the motherboard. We'll just have like portable motherboard things. It's like boop. I mini soldiers. You just like solder on like a little piece I, and like transfer the information. Um. Quantum computers might turn into a thing a bit like um, the fusion technology. Yeah, it's going to be is, um, 50 years away forever. It's always 50 years away. Or the thing I love about it's always 50 years away is um, we have a fusion reactor that can charge a phone with positive energy. Like, you don't lose energy from it. Right. It charges a phone. That's all it can do. That's like the most energy you can give out. But it's getting energy just from water. I saw... Um... In the what if book he has yeah. this chart of like power sources that are possible on mars mm. and he was like you can't do wind power on mars there's not enough atmosphere you can't do water power on mars there's no water yeah. you can't do solar power on mars it's too far away from the sun you can't do fusion power on mars that doesn't even work on earth <laughs> can you do earthquake power and asteroid striking power no no the one power source he came up with which is really cool is you could you can actually get wind power on mars but it's kind of insane you strap a massive um, wind turbine, like absolutely massive, mm -hmm. to the moon, like Mars's moon, and then you have the moon wingless string through Mars's atmosphere at incredible rates and pull the moon towards Mars and like crash it into Mars. What about can you get static power from Mars from oh. their static storms in the dust? I don't know. I don't know how you. I don't know how lightning rods work even, and they don't give much power, so yeah. I don't think static electricity would be the, the winner's choice. But uh, yeah, the, the moon strapping um, giant uh, 
turbines. Turbines to the moon. I like that idea. Like on really long tethers. Yeah. So they're in Mars' atmosphere. Slowly slowing down the rotation of the Mars and the moon. They, they would cause the moon to crash into Mars faster, yeah. Yeah. But well, the I'm... nice thing is, the closer the moon gets to Mars, the faster it goes. Mm. So the and, more power you get. I mean, is like things will... Like the Earth will stop spinning eventually, so... Yeah. Well, the moon, Mars's moon is actually crashing into Mars already. So. Yeah, I'm saying, like, time's fine now already, so why not speed up at a few thousand years? Yeah, or, yeah, it, it's going to take a long time. I think what we should do that with our own moon. It's really far away. I don't think we could have a, th a thread lo long enough. But our moon's going away, so if we can pull it back towards us... <laughs> don't let it escape. Yeah, it's our moon. Yeah. Nobody else gets it. So, yeah, quantum computers, not going to happen. So this is just computers that we've been talking about, but so medical wise, right? Yeah. Like, what was, have you heard anything interesting about medical technology developments? No. Okay, well. Still as slow as ever. Still as slow as ever in development? We still have people that, like, we have still have osteoporition, what, what no, osteo, osteoporosis? No. Uh, the, the bone doctors. We still mm. have bone doctors. Mm. We're, we're, we, we have... We're still savages? We, we live in the future with our computers and in the medieval ages with our doctors. Well, I mean, we're using AIs to recognize cancer now. Are we using it or is it possible to do? Well, sorry, fine. It's in development. Yeah. How's that? So in 10 years time. Maybe. Maybe it could be like a second opinion. But I... Recognizing cancer, that's like... That's still pretty medieval, isn't it? Like, it's basically getting a second doctor in the room like, Hey, does this lump look bad to you? Uh, let me poke it. That hurt? Yeah? Yeah, that's probably a... Oh, it's pro that's what the AI is. It's just like... AI, is this... Uh, does this guy have cancer? Well, uh, yeah, I think I've, I've seen 10 million examples of cancer and 10 million examples of health, so... I'm basically just a doctor that's seen a lot of patients, and uh, that's, that's probably cancer, yeah. I talked to my friend WMD, uh, WebMD, and he said, yep, definitely cancer. So. <laughs> and also syphilis. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's going to need a full decapitation. Whole works. Just, uh, so, you're saying... I, medical well, technology is, is just, like, it, I don't know. It seems like it's developing incredibly slow. The problem is there's, like, a million diseases. Yeah. And to... To fix all of them, you have to spread your resources really well, thin. I used to, like, wonder, like, why are we always putting so much work into cancer? Yeah. Because, like, I didn't really know much about cancer, and I, like, heard about it a bit. I looked at this graph recently of um, things that kill humans. Cancer's big on it. Yeah. Cancer's really big. There's only one thing bigger than it. That's what, car crashes? Uh, no. Cancer's higher than car crashes. Heart attack? Yes. Yeah. It's, um, heart attacks, like, what is it called? The circulation diseases. Yeah. And that's bigger than cancer by quite cardiovascular a bit. Cardiovascular disease. Yeah, cardiovascular. Yeah. That's bigger by, than cancer by quite a bit. Or I think cardiovascular is actually one of the easiest ones to solve. Yeah, just be healthy. Yeah. And have good hearts. Well, there's people that just have heart problems. Yeah, but I'm saying like... We yeah, could, you could get a majority. We could reduce that so cancer would be the biggest killer. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> the thing about cancer is it's not... A disease it's many diseases yeah and it's like viruses we, we don't have a cure for virus we don't have a cure for cancer you have a mm -hmm. cure for you have a cure for polio or you have a cure for hepatitis you have a cure for bone cancer or you have a cure for brain cancer you, you can't mm -hmm. I don't even know if polio is a virus my but I'm not sure but we actually but you know there is some stuff that has been like smallpox yeah there hasn't been a death since 73 I believe we've gotten rid we'll of see the bubonic that. plague there hasn't been a death since, like, probably a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, gotten rid of... Uh, well, the Spanish flu just kind of died out, I think. Yeah. It's the same with Black Plague. We don't actually have a cure for the Black Plague, really. Um, no, there is. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you can get inoculated to the Black Death. Swine flu, that's 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 doing all... That's basically... You don't hear about that anymore. Mm -hmm. Zika, that's still a problem. The thing is, viruses... Like, humans are one of the best adapters on this planet. But viruses have a speed currently, I think. Or we're, I think we might be slightly faster, but we have a couple of million years of catching up to Is do. Is Zika still a problem? Yeah, as, uh, far, as far as I'm aware. It's... I thought it's just it got everyone is going to get. No, and... it's, it's like getting to the States now and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. And it's, they're finding more and more bad side effects to it from what I remember. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's an issue. But um, 
we're, we're getting, I think we might actually be adapting faster than viruses. It's just, that, yeah, they've got a couple million years of head start and they're also yeah. like, they, they can like split their, our efforts by just do it, making branches of like, oh, I'm going to become this kind of disease and this one's going to become this disease. Now you have to have two research teams. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Very hard to stop. And, and, um, until you make a kill all yeah, bacteria as well, or like they, bacteria seem simpler to deal with, but then th they're like incredibly adaptive because it's like, oh, well, bacteria are living. We can just kill them. And then they're like, guess what? We're immune to everything now. You suckers have made us stronger. They're like, we're just using you. <laughs> they're like the Borg. It's not good to be stronger because it mm. wastes their energy, but they can do it. Yeah. Well, I'm saying like, you suck. What was the one thing? It's like, um, give it a break with um, antibiotics, like a 20 year break with antibiotics to make them weak again. Right. And then start slapping them again. <laughs> Which does, I don't think that sounds like a good system. Give them a sucker punch. Wah! Yeah. The one thing I saw was like these little, I think they were plastic like spike balls basically you can yeah. take as a medicine to just yeah. tear them apart. <laughs> that seems like, I don't know, wouldn't cell damage be an issue? Um, What's well, another one? Um, get viruses. Yeah, no. Get bacteriophages. Um, yeah, um, DNA coded bacteriophages. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest problems with that is they start attacking all bacteria in the body, and sometimes they mutate and start attacking cells. Yeah. And then you have <laughs> another issue. Or another problem with the bacteriophage thing is like, all right, let's give you this bacteriophage to counteract this um, these bacteria you have. Then one of your white blood cells goes, wait a minute. That's not meant to be here, and it eats to your helpful buddies. Because we have a lot of trouble telling our body not to attack stuff. Yeah. Wouldn't it be fun to, like, domesticate viruses, though? <laughs> like, we already domesticated some bacteria to make cheese. Yeah. Like, stuff. I think people are trying to domesticate viruses. We've domesticated strep throat to make our cheese. <laughs> people are trying... <laughs> Ew. <laughs> it's this... I think it's the same uh, bacteria. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um... Or similar strain, but <laughs> next we're going to try to domesticate uh, prions. Yeah, we're going to get them to like if someone has really good genetics, we're going to get them to steal them from people and give them to other people. So yeah. give someone a prion that will rewrite someone to have amazing genetics. If you had like a disease, mm -hmm. you could just give one person the cure, and then everyone they came into contact with would get the cure. <laughs> that would be so cool. You could use prions to get rid of cancer as well. Yeah, it, like it would just cure their cancer and then cure everyone else's cancer. Yeah, and then... it rewrites them so they no longer have cancer. And then there'd be some horrible dystopia where everyone's like... Jeff. No, it's just like a prion goes bad and then suddenly everyone just melts. Or everyone's Jeff. Yeah. Because like, yeah, Jeff is like the most healthy person on the planet. So we're going to like make a prion from him and now he affects other people. And then people just start looking like this factory worker. Well, that's fine. Like as long as everyone's like half healthy, you know. That's fine. It's like, that's, that's more, that's still a utopia. It's just a weird one. <laughs> they all have pencil mustaches. Yeah. It's, but it's not like suddenly everyone's like limbs start falling off because we, we accidentally gave this thing too much access. And yeah, there's um this thing called like Blood Wars or something. It's this series on Netflix, which is basically a prion gets out and starts turning people into vampires. But like the original two people affected by it, it's like, yeah, you're cleared. You can like leave your quarantine now. It's like, these two are infected by a prion. You don't clear someone from prions with quarantine. Because actually, you don't. If someone has a prion, they don't get cleared from quarantine. Then what do you do? You just keep them there forever? Um, you try to make it as best for them to live with a prion in quarantine. That's literally how dangerous they are. Yeah, so that, that, sounds, that sucks. I think you should just let them go if they don't have any ill effects. And this, this, what is this show? It probably takes place in the future or something. So that if they know how to... See, these are doctors, Connor. They know more than you about prions. They know you shouldn't let people with prions free. So if they say they're clear, they're clear. Because these doctors know what they're doing. Prions are one of the few things like that we don't know anything about. Yeah, and that's... Viruses were like that like 40 years ago. So... We still know nothing about viruses. We know a lot more. Yeah, but prions, in some cases, can be transmitted through touch. Yeah, well... Just touch. So, not, not the sweat of the touch. It's the touch. Like, skin contact... It will go from one person's skin to the other. Well, we're going to discover some sort of like brainwave thing. Like prions, 20 years from now, we're going to know as much about prions as we used to know about viruses 20 years ago, right? And prions, they're going to be old hat. It's going to be the brainwave things that like, 
like your you can like influence people with your mood around you and it's gonna it's gonna be a mess and you have to like get rid of the you have to use the crystals to divert divert the bad mojo into your tarot deck and burn it like that's gonna be the new science and then we're gonna be like wait the cure for depression was was magic rocks all along or it's it's gonna turn out that positive thinking's the cure because um then you can just you just like defeat the the mental waves and and it's like wait so if you're depressed just be happy dang it i knew that was right it's, it made so much sense <laughs> but yeah medical technology i don't know it, there's too much to work on to really advance in an exciting manner computers are like this very small problem that a lot of people have devoted their time to and because it's the computers also give feedback which is nice but yeah. it's not like back like imagine every time you killed a bacteria it was like Hey, uh, before I go, let me tell you how to take down these six other guys. But computers are computers totally different. They're, they're like, oh yeah, here, let me calculate this for you. Let me help you with this thing. Let me do that. It's great, but but viruses and bacteria. I guess computers are our most advanced technology, and that's why we like working on them. But bacteria, they're like, oh well, you think you know what you're gonna do? Well, I'm gonna warn everyone, and they're all going to change, and you're gonna go back to square one. Ha. Hmm. Yeah, I guess like what medical technology, we're still like giving people paste to eat. Yeah. Um, cars, our vehicles are still explosions and spinning discs. Yeah, we're starting to change that. Well, it's still spinning discs. But electric cars are like more futuristic, at least. Yeah, and but our... they're shorter range, so they're not like all better. But that's a steel, right? Mm -hmm. Steel. This is cool. Let, let's fi let you finish your sentence because it's going right. to be cool. <laughs> I was just saying, um, power is boiling water. Yeah. Yeah, nuclear power is boiling water. <laughs> yeah. All power is boiling water except for solar, which is having rocks react to light. Solar is much more advanced. No, it's having rocks react to light. That is what solar is. And, um, and, yeah. But, you know, that's cool. So steel, right? Yeah. Speaking of electric cars, they're, they have way less range than most modern cars. Yeah. And they, uh, they, they, yeah, they have less range. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they're worse. Like steel, for example, compared to bronze. Steel is better at almost everything than bronze. Yeah. And if you compare steel to copper, it's almost better than everything. If you s compare steel to iron, it's almost better than everything. But I think you'll find in all those cases, all those things do something slightly better than steel. Mm -hmm. Like iron is probably a little bit more flexible. And uh, bronze doesn't rust. And copper is shiny. And conductive. Yeah, I, I don't know if copper has any advantages, but if you want to make, I mean, it's more conductive, yeah. And also oxidizes into a long-lasting I should explain that I'm talking about swords here. Okay. So, in, if you're making a sword... All right, sure. <laughs> obsidian, sharper, but steel is almost as good as all of those things, which means, like, steel is almost as sharp as obsidian. Mm -hmm. It's almost as rust-resistant as bronze. It's almost as strong as, like, titanium. It's almost as easy to work with as copper. It's copper almost, is incredibly yeah. easy to yeah. work with. It's almost as easy to work with as copper or iron. Mm -hmm. It's... So it's, like, almost as good as all those things. So that's why we use steel. Because mm -hmm. it's, like, almost there, but it's that for every category. So if you, if you really want to be specialized in things, you should actually use, like, obsidian scalpels and like bronze diving equipment and you know like but yeah. I, I just think but you can't spend time making factories so specific to each thing yeah and i think that's really cool that steel so are you saying should gas powered cars start working towards range um i, I just think that uh, electric cars will replace gas powered cars without improving the range because mm -hmm. we don't care about that we care about no i say like the gas powered cars should start working towards we have range maybe i i think that we should just Give up on them. I th just just give up on being able to travel that far. Hmm. Like we we steel is just so good at everything that we we don't care about the tiny losses. And I think electric cars are going to be like that as well. It's we'll just build more gas stations, electricity stations. Hmm. I don't like electric cars anymore. <laughs> it's going to be confusing. Electric stations, <laughs> charging stations. Yeah. Massive charging ports everywhere. Although, do you think they're going to be called charging stations or swap stations? Because I think we're going to find switching batteries is going to be the way to go. Just like... Mm. I don't know. Supercharging can be pretty fast. It takes like 10 minutes. Yeah. A gas station takes like 2 minutes or 1 minute. You're just like... Psh. 
people are going to have to slow down. The, yeah. There's air is going to be cleaner. They're going to be using less energy overall, and they're going to have to like slow down and plan their lives out. It's going to be awful. <laughs> I don't I don't like that future you're drawing here. <laughs> you ever think about how teleporters would change everything? Yeah. Well, no, one of the things I really thought about was when I was in Alberta, right? Yeah. And you're like driving through these big open fields and these roads everywhere. And I was just thinking like, these roads, like, they don't think of a lot of space, but they kind of do. And they make like crossing land really difficult and they kind of like ruin the scenery. And I'm thinking just like teleporters. Yeah. And then you like... Literally, you teleport to your farm. Like, you have one to your porch and your farm, right? Yeah. And then you just have these expanses of fields with, like, no roads. Or maybe roads just for your tractors. Yeah. And, like, the wilderness doesn't have these long highways throughout it. So teleporters, right? When they get introduced. Yeah. I think they should start in every capital city. Mm -hmm. um, especially Memphis, I believe it is. Which is where Amazon has its headquarters. Wherever Amazon has its, heads wherever Amazon has its headquarters, mm -hmm. should be a teleporter there. There should be a teleporter in every capital city. or Three maybe in Tokyo. <laughs> or maybe there should be... Maybe it should be population-based. But yeah. I think to start with, just every capital city. Because it's not about moving people so much as... Um, moving stuff. A, as covering a large area. Yeah. It's because even if... A, you could put a teleporter in some tiny town in France and some tiny town in Mexico. And that would be better than, like, Tokyo and Kyoto. Because... That teleporter isn't helping out the most of the world. But mm -hmm. if you can make getting across the Atlantic Ocean quicker, yeah. then that's really good. Well, I'm saying just like one in like Tokyo because it just they export and import a lot. Yeah. So you want one in... No, okay. You get one teleporter first. That's mm -hmm. useless. Okay. First two teleporters. Yeah. You want one... These are teleporters like a gate you walk through or a little pad you stand on? Yeah. So you probably want one in like... Let's no, no, no. This is like a big gate you walk yeah, through. Yeah, I'm saying most realistically, it probably would be a gate that you make a controlled wormhole. So you, you get a giant gate, right? This is the first... These are teleporters. They're giant yeah. gates. Yeah. You can get smaller ones, but the cost is way too much for the yeah. first two. So you build one in where? Like Germany, somewhere. So you put one in Berlin, and you put one in New York or Chicago. Yeah. I think is probably where you want to start. Like connect Germany and the United States, or maybe China and the United yeah. States. And now the issue with... Um, teleporters security is security you would have to have like an incredible amount of security on them yeah so what i think they should do is be limited so let's say to get to um well, let's use the um so i guess you didn't read that book but the god's dome war solution which is teleporters are in underground bunkers mm. so my thought is simpler you have international teleporters mm -hmm. and you have local teleporters so you have you have like this great big gate that takes you from Chicago to Berlin. Yeah. And then you have... To go through customs. And then you have a much smaller one in Berlin, like next door. Mm -hmm. And that has like five little teleporters in it. And one takes you to like, um, to little Germans, to, to a bunch of little German cities. Yeah, like Frankfurt and... Um... Yeah, Frankfurt, Hamburg, yeah. all those places. And then in Frankfurt and Hamburg, you have a bunch of like single person teleporters and those take you to... The, the local, like, province or whatever it is. Yeah, sort like of. little towns. Yeah, little towns. And uh, so so it's still a network, and mm -hmm. if you want to... So you still have to plan out a path to get through, but I think you just have to do that for security. Yeah. So you can have, like, a machine gun pointed at the big gate or something. Yeah. Which sounds... Or maybe just have, like, a... The, the thing nice thing about security, though, is you might... If, like, if, like, ten armed people start marching through, you might be able to just flip a switch and, like... Yeah. But the problem is if, like, an ICBM flies through, yeah. then suddenly you've nuked the center of Chicago. So maybe underground bunkers is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a shame. It's like computer viruses. There is no need for them to exist. They're not yeah. a natural product of the world. It's just some people want to ruin everything for everyone. Well, I... Although, like, teleporters like that, let's say. Yeah. They destroy borders. They do. Not, not yet. So we have two down. Okay. The first seven are one on each continent. Mm -hmm. And then, once it starts getting bigger, I say one in each capital of each country. Yeah. And then, or your biggest city, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't think a one in Washington would be that useful in the States. Yeah. Or in Ottawa and Canada wouldn't be that useful. Yeah. But in, like, Toronto and New York or something. Yeah. Or, or uh, San Francisco or something. That'd be useful. And then, yeah, you... you, you 
and then I think after that, after you started doing like all capitals, which I guess I said of each country, mm-hmm. but then all capitals of like each province of each country if possible. Yeah. And then you start trying to just fill in distances. Like yeah. there's a big gap here, let's throw in a teleporter there. So you still have cars and roads and everything, mm-hmm. but they're for short distances. Yeah. And the big thing you want to transport is goods mm-hmm. and people. I think goods are the biggest. Yeah. And then people. And then even biggest is electricity. Because, yeah. wow, would that change everything. Power lines, you don't have to maintain those. You get, But that would be home-to-home teleportation. Unless you have well, imagine like what... a giant nuclear factory in Hawaii. Like you yeah. just get kick everyone out of Hawaii, turn the whole place into geothermal. Yeah, or and then I was thinking just... more like um, Greenland. Like yeah. you just have like Greenland just turns into a factory. Yeah, and then you teleport that to like a bunch of city centers and they mm-hmm. use their existing power system to yeah. send it out. And then in like... But it'd be nice if you could get rid of, like, power lines in general. But I think that would take a lot of, like, tiny teleportation. Mm -hmm. And then, once you're getting, like, the home-to-home teleportation systems, or at least you get, like, the local bus stop teleporter sort of level, then we get to the issue of... No borders. No borders. Yeah. Right. No borders anywhere. And, like, at that point, um, I feel like people have to almost change... They have to redefine themselves by their beliefs instead of by their country, land, country or something. Yeah. And there's a great series about that called um, uh, uh, Two, Two Like the Lightning oh, by really? Ada Palmer. Uh, do they have teleporting technology? No, they have cars that can take you anywhere on Earth within two hours. Ah. Flying cars. I think um, two to four a hours. teleporter system like this, which is like... Or maybe it was 45 minutes. Like this teleporting system to that point is like you walk and you go wherever you want. Yeah. <laughs> Basically... Yeah. And the cars are the same, though. Like, if mm-hmm. it's 45 to 4 hours, whatever it was, mm-hmm. anywhere on Earth, you can basically say, I'm going to go to Hawaii. Like, yeah. Phew. And um, so everyone redefines themselves by what they believe in. Yeah. So there's the humanists, there's the Mutabushi who believe in, like, industry and business growth. And, and yeah, so they redefine themselves, and they, they get to live in their favorite place on Earth. They get to visit all their favorite places. They live in little, like, enclaves. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like a utopia, and it's actually a utopia, which is unusual for. Um, it's, but it's not a. It's not like a real utopia. It's mm. like. Um, but it's not a dystopia. It's mm. like. It's like if someone in the medieval ages read about today, they'd yeah. be like, "Wow, that sounds pretty nice." I feel. I like... can't believe they stopped burning cats like those yeah. those sissies in the future. But mm-hmm. but oh no, no, all in all, I think I'd rather live then than now. I feel like a lot of people would live in Africa. Could be. I think a lot of people would go to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Just, oh, tornado. I'm out. Whee! Yeah. But well, the volcano slowly through the pell water. Turn it off! Turn it off! Yeah. Like, I think... Although Africa as well, like, you ever look at pictures of Africa and go like, yeah. man, that's where I'm meant to be. Yeah. I, I, I saw some pictures of Africa. And I My like, more thoughts is like, man, that like, in the um, parts of Africa that aren't desert and horrible, like, the more... Is it arid? Yeah. The more arid parts of Africa, like, they look like you can walk around in shorts and a t-shirt all the time. Oh, um, yeah. Like, basically, like, you, like, the, the weather is what's meant for humans. Yeah. Like, not wrapped up in a pile of clothing and suffering outside. Yeah, it just looks like home. Or not dying in a desert. It'd be also nice if the ozone layer rehealed and we could not worry about sunburn and everything so much. It is healing. Yeah, but then, it, the, then China and India kind of put a big hole in it again yeah but i think that's getting better too mm-hmm. and we can't really blame them for doing it it's like everyone else did but mm-hmm. but still come on guys <laughs> i well, burn easily yeah well i mean and the chinese they're it's double unfair because they have a nice natural protection of smog <laughs> over their whole country <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah um that's getting better too Although speaking of technolo- technological advancements, like I think a big one that I look forward to is meat. Mm. This being grown. Oh yeah, maybe that could go horribly wrong. How so? I think it could be similar to um, what we've done with uh, grains, mm. where we discover we need to like stop a whole bunch of bacteria from getting into the back- grown meat because it's just an incubator for bacteria, and instead of like. Oh, we have to start over. You just pump it full of, like, bleach, and then you're like, okay, there we go. Rinse that off. We'll be good to go. Like, I, I think there's just going to be a lot of issues of, like, 
What if we just made meat that was immune to botulism? And and because we can just tinker with the genetics here with no ill effects, and, and then no one will be able to eat meat. Yeah, because you know how like grains are yeah. super tough now for like so they can survive a lot of cold and a lot of yeah. like drought and a lot of like all sorts of crazy conditions. They're also really hard to digest. I don't know if that's different from what it used to be, but it, I, it seems like there's a lot of whiny people out there with. Gluten intolerance. Maybe I, maybe people are just getting whiny. I think it's but, people have the choice to be whiny now. Yeah. Uh, um, they haven't for the last 10,000 years. Yeah, <laughs> actually. I, I think that's why. I don't know. If it was bad for us for 10,000 years, then we... Sh then we like. I think, I think that a lot of people are just being wimps about it. But also, maybe there's something going on. Yeah. I think, like, people that think they have gluten intolerances and are probably wrong. It's probably something else that's related to gluten. Yeah. Like, they always buy red robin flour, and red robin flour, this is not an accusation, this is just me s saying the possibility of, like, hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Could be any company, could be any yeah. cause, but red robin flour happens to be packaged in some sort of, um, like, paper plastic composite, which it turns out that half of people are allergic to. Something yeah. like that. I think that's probably the actual cause for a lot of this well, stuff. Well, um, what's... Um... What our dad's friends? Yeah, he's have. he's allergic to um, Roundup. Yeah, and yeah. so it turns out that he isn't allergic to wheat. He's allergic to Roundup. Yeah, and a lot of wheat is treated with Roundup. But if he gets wheat from Europe, he's fine. Yeah, because they don't use it Roundup because it's illegal. Yeah, so I, I think that's what's going on. Yeah, so maybe I I I, I but we don't know because <laughs> we have we know less nutrition than eight like. The Chinese, like, 10,000 years ago, so... Yeah. <laughs> the but, Chinese weren't even around 10,000 years ago, and they knew more about nutrition than we do. Yeah, but what I'm saying is... Okay, so... Ha have you ever had non-organic beef from, like, a supermarket? Yes. Because it's horrible. Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I had some, it's really gross. Or, like, salami. Like, it's, it's gross. I like salami. Yeah, but it's gross stuff. Like, you can't eat a handful of it. I could... You can't eat two handfuls of it and feel good afterwards. Mm, I don't know. I, I like salami. Okay, but anyway, so with that grow meat, like maybe mm, that fat <laughs> grown. With the, how can you make it sound appealing? Cruelty-free meat. Sure, with the cruelty-free meat. Um, yeah. with the with the veet. There we go. We'll call it veet. Vegan meat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, vegans don't eat honey, so... Whatever. Yeah. We'll just call it the eyes more bat meat. Ah, bat meat. Okay. Veet. Veet. I like it. Yeah, so with the veet... Um... We sound like we're in a Margaret Atwood novel. I don't like it. Let's call it something else. Okay, what 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 other things have been really weird that has been sold? Like, um, uh, GMOs. So we have, um, VGM. Vat grown meat. <laughs> VGMs. Yeah, with the VGMs, right? Like, yeah. I, I'm going to call it Veet. Okay. It's Veet, yes. Um, it's, like, maybe some of them will be, like, really bad, but some, like, you can get the organic Veet. And you can have people, like, prank you and take a, a cell, like, the workers, disgruntled workers can, like, take a sample from their butt and <laughs> shove it in the thing to prank people. Cannibalism's really bad. And it's like, yeah, hey, you were eating bat grown meat worker butt. Ugh. Have to have very high health control, <laughs> DNA tested. Well, that's why I don't. For every shipment. See, that's I don't think that'll happen, and that's that's my concern. Okay, but let's. <laughs> you ruined it for me. <laughs> I'm just saying, like getting. Although rid of... airplanes seem unlikely as well, so and they work most of the time. Getting rid of cows and like vast amounts of chickens. Yeah. Would be really good. Yeah. Because like cows take up a lot of energy. Yeah. Also, a uh, thing I learned about cows is cows don't actually mate anymore. It's all humans doing that. And they're very energy inefficient cows. Yeah. But, but cows, like, don't even reproduce naturally. Yeah, they're like bananas. Yeah, actually. <laughs> um, like what humans have done to cows. Yeah. Um, and, like, cows that you eat for food, like non-milk cows, get two years to live. Yeah. Maybe three. Yeah, it's the, the, the humane level is awful, and then the... The land usage, the energy waste, the water runoff. Yeah. The, there's huge ecological effects. There's ethical effects. There's environmental effects. There's yeah. just ridiculous also, it's inefficient super, costs. It's super... Like, fat-grown meat, everything Health you issues. feed it, 
yeah. goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Cows, you feed it, they fart it out. Yeah, it's much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's got a lot of positives on all fronts. Yeah. Except I'm just worried about eating worker butt. Yeah, or or just like I said, like, oh, this is a this is like an this is a E. coli culture. That's well, let's just dump some bleach in. Or let's get like they're gonna stick these in nuclear reactors to to just in nuclear reactors to uh just sterilize all the food. Like I'm don't mind that. You're just gonna be eating like a bunch of like sterilized poop with your meat. It's and you won't. That's what'll give it its color because it doesn't have blood in it, so it's white. But they can mix it with poop and sterilize it. And they can grow blood with it. But that's just weird. What? But you know what the exciting thing is, vat-grown organs and stuff. <laughs> that's exciting. Fact, I was. Ooh, I'm going to eat some vat-grown heart and some vat-grown liver. No, 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 because. No, human hearts and livers and stuff. Oh, that's even worse. Because there's two reasons, right? First of all, climate change is caused by the lack of sacrifices to the to the Inca sun god. So if we can get a bunch of vat grown hearts, we can like stab like 500 of those on a on an altar to make up for lost time. Secondly. Organ donation. Imagine if that worked. <laughs> like, it, yeah, it just turns out the Incans were right, and we screwed up majorly. <laughs> Anyways, world's problems are solved. We're no longer getting hurricanes or wildfires everywhere. Just need a few human hearts. You sacrifice a heart a year. It was so simple. Goats would have worked too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we didn't think of this sooner, but yeah, it hasn't been a tornado since since the year two thousand and and twenty three when we elected Cameron as world leader. <laughs> yeah. I no guess. flooding, no tidal yeah. waves, no fires, no volcanoes going off in bad places. That was such a great idea. Ozone layer, that's healed. No more war. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Like, the reason the Incas were doing wars was just to decide who got to put their hearts in the pile. Yeah. And who? how did Cameron come up with this idea? Well, he had some Hindu advisors who told him about how to game religion. <laughs> you see... If you spin this wheel, you pray. So we've hooked it up to a windmill. <laughs> and it's and it gives us a prayer every five seconds. And we stack them in layers. Yeah. And we get a prayer every half second. Yeah. And it's colorful. And it makes a nice sound. Yeah. Uh, so, so what's number two? Number two, uh, the lines for like organ donation and stuff would mm -hmm. drastically reduce. And Also, morally, I could use those. Yeah. And plus... Then we could we would have this fun thing where you still need like to clone someone right to mm. to someone's heart. So then you could have like strongest heart contests. Like you could be like, man, I could do with like half Thor Bjornsson's heart. Yeah, and, and I could deal with his arms and legs. Like his aortas are like coming out of your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking like, like these bane tubes. Just like <laughs> I'm just thinking like. All the man world are going around with like their head on half Thor Bjornsson's body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you've got like this like pasty face, like really like beardless guy with half Thor Bjornsson's huge hairy body. <laughs> Most of the women too. <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to be half Thor Bjornsson. <laughs> yeah, even this like yeah, I just want his like right leg. I'm a soccer player. I need to kick really hard, so I'll just yeah. take his legs. <laughs> yeah, and that that is a future. That I want to sprint a lot. I'll take a Hussein's Bolt's body. That future might be coming about as quick as like the holodeck. I think forty years we could have everyone like being half their Bjornsson. Half their Bjornsson or Hussein Bolt. Yeah. Or that swimmer. Yeah, with Michael the Phelps. huge lungs. Yeah. Or um, that rock climber with the fingers that can lock there's some rock climber who on um, like his finger here yeah like they can stay straight and lock hmm. and he just has ridiculous grip strength but yeah that's that that's coming soon i think like vat grown meat it, it's it's they they can already do it mm -hmm. apparently it doesn't it tastes kind of weird like it's a bit off-putting because it's not full of blood but... it's pretty energy efficient now too yeah. like compared to what it used to be and also like think about like the potential like sacrifices like you could like everyone could get like you could summon demons all the time. Well, you could get like 50 burgers, right? Yeah. And then before a meal, you slaughter a goat and pour its blood on the burgers and mix it together. And then you have some bloody meat like you want. And you bring back ritual sacrifice. Yeah. You bring the whole family together. Yeah. And you can paint the, your cities in blood when you make a new building. Yeah. I, I think like 
a lot of our problems could be solved by ritual sacrifice. And, and also, like, blood donations, even. That's a big thing. But yeah. you can just grow a vat of blood. If we can get the DNA of that Australian... I think he's Australian. Dude with, like, the amazing blood that yeah. anyone can use. Because, for some reason, his blood just... Is magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Magic comes out of his veins. Like, like anyone can use his blood, mm. any blood type. And it, like, mm. cures, like, all sorts of crazy stuff. Just, like, get... Like, but when he bleeds, is it rainbow-colored or something? <laughs> like, Just get, like, massive, like... Like, that becomes, like, the most valuable substance. Forget oil or yeah. coffee. The, the most shipped liquid is now his blood. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just samples of his blood, so then you can grow it in your own vat. And then you, the you go location. to the local witch doctor, because, like, medicine's thrown out the window, and it's yeah. like, so I have a cough. Have you tried four drams of, of go the golden man's blood? No, <laughs> can't worry. It gets even worse than that. I must, like, cough right now. Um, sure, we'll just clone your lungs. Take that out. Like, it'll, we'll just get really good at, like, doing transplants with our own organs. I just want, like, every cure to be just, like, drinking his blood. Oh, oh like, I have a cut on my hand. Can I just, like... <laughs> Wait, I drink. recommend a full blood transfusion. Yeah. That's every cure. It's just, like... And you get, like, Actually, a full blood transfusion is a pretty good cure. You get your at-home kit of, like... <laughs> And then you get to the thing where you're like, you have your printer set up so you can print your organs, right? Yeah. In your own home. And then someone sends you Ebola. They hack into your system, they send you Ebola. Yeah. And then you teleport it back at them. Yeah. <laughs> Along with some of your butt meat. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you teleport your butt meat as infected with Ebola. Yeah, that's the new trolling, is just sending people butt meat in the mail. And then that cyanide and happiness thing. What's that? Um, they wanted to show off their new 3D printer, mm. but they did animation of this guy. He scans one of his coworkers' butts, and he takes it like rubs his face in it. He's like, I'm so weird. And then they show off their new 3D printer. He's like, oh, that's a pretty weird sketch. Yeah, it was. And then he goes in, prints out a butt with their new 3D printer, <laughs> rubs his face in it. So now they could just print an actual butt. <laughs> yeah, I think that's like... I think that's close, like 40 years from now. Teleporters... Yeah, printing technology. Yeah. Like, you just print yourself a new house. Yeah, or a new butt. Yeah. But, like, the background meat and everything, that's 40 years at most. The teleporters and stuff? No idea. No idea. Could be tomorrow, could be a million years from now. Yeah. It, who knows if it's possible. Who knows... Although, warp is possible. If you can do it... Do, wait, warp, like folding space or something? Yeah, it's... Mm. Has, no, it has been done on Earth. It can actually be done. Like, we've done it. So, if that's possible, I don't want to do teleportation. Because you get some weird, like... Ethical, moral issues. Yeah, teleportation's a bit weird. If The way we think about it. Maybe the warping stuff. Like, that's yeah. a better way to do it. You just put a hole in. Or maybe we find a way to... to just punch a hole in time space and walk through. Define consciousness. Mm. Or, you know, be cool. Black holes, right? Yeah. All times and all directions lead to the center of a black hole. Yeah. Within its event horizon. What if teleportation was a way you just step outside the universe, mm -hmm. choose a place and time, step back in? Just... And it's just, it's like localized though, so you yeah. can't like, it, it doesn't go super far. But like, what we're gonna, what's going to happen is someone's going to be like, someone's going to be on the phone and be like, hey, uh, what year is it? And like, oh, it's uh, 2050. And it's like, hmm, so the time machine worked. Uh, so in 10 years, there's going to be a time machine. Because um, uh, I was testing it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So, and be, everyone will be like, yay! And then everyone will sit back and wait for it, and it won't happen. And <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, going back to the thing about warp, um, just so people don't get any misconceptions about it, is that... Um, you need an emperor. No. To... So, the mathematics for it was done about 20 years ago by a, college, a student. Who I think he was like in the seventh grade, or farther back than even 20 years. And he did the math and it worked. And now, like, recently he's done the math again and it still works. And they've run simulations on it and it works. And um, you can warp uh, space-time. Like, you can create the proper warp bubble, which is what you want, with electromagnetic fields. They do a very small amount of it. Hmm. The amount of energy, though, required to make a warp engine like the Enterprise has would literally take Jupiter right. to do. Hmm. Like, turning Jupiter into so, energy. So it's not super feasible. The The solution for it, there's two solutions. One is exotic material, which is scientists' way of basically saying we need to find a bullshit new material to we solve our magic. problem. 
And the other one is as close to magic is um, also the solution that uh, Star Trek has, which is antimatter to produce energy. Because mm. antimatter reactors redu- produce absurd amount of power. Right. And so that would be the other way to do it. So that's, that's a long ways off still. Yeah, but it's possible. I'm saying that's possible. Right. So yeah, that's probably not something going to get, you know, we're not, we're not going to be teleporting 3D butts to each other anytime soon. No, but you can like print So someone. you can mail them to each other. Yeah, and you can also hack the machine and make yeah. their machine print a butt for them. Yeah. You are listening to The Fool and the Philosopher. Do-it-yourself cosmetic surgery. How, like, what a nightmare that might become. Well, just, you know, like, Skyrim, like... Although the... you can do it yourself now. You, if mm-hmm. you have, like, a bit of a, a crooked nose, just take a knife and, like, scrape it down a bit. I mean, you can do that already. Yeah, but could... You know, like, the character creations and how, like, yeah. every once in a while you make a good character. If you, if you have, like, a saved library, there's, like, 20 hideous. Yeah. That's, like, there's going to be one good lucky person than 20 hideous. <laughs> like... Oh, I'm really excited. I just ordered this new nose. I'm going to, in the mail, I'm going to just like Graft sh- it on. chop off my nose and, and get some super glue. And like, I think hospitals will have the monopoly on that sort of thing for a while still. Yeah. See, because technology, we're, we're, it's, it's just, humans are too complicated for now. Yeah. But still, like, but look at how far we've come in 20 yeah, years. But pretty enough organs. Like, you know what? Laptops these days, you can yeah. replace pieces in pretty easily. Yeah. Like, so humans are like laptops now. Basically, it's tricky, but you can do it. But you can, no one people can't build their own laptop typically. Mm-hmm. But you can you can yeah. sw- mix mix and match, swap them out. Mm-hmm. You want a slightly better heart? You want a third kidney? Mm-hmm. Go for it. And I mean, once we get a little more scammy on the brain, you can start switching parts of your brain out so you can get like better memory and yeah, and swap out like the, the uh, part that makes you depressed and yeah, and and like. And then you get into really weird stuff where you say, "What? who am I? What is a person? Are mm. people even just anything? Because mm. then you're starting to say, wait, if I get rid of my depression, is, am I myself? Mm-hmm. Or like, wait a minute, I can cure my gayness. Wait, cure it? But it was it didn't need a cure. But if I can get rid of it, then surely it does need a cure because mm-hmm. then, but wait, what, what do I want from my life? Do I want to be me or do I want to... I can make myself gay. Yeah. Like that. that gets weird because then... You're redefining who you are. Yeah. And that is... Um, and then at that point, like, you're redefining who you are, but then it's like, yeah, wait, um, as a model employee, we need you to be more obedient. So we need you to be gay. Yeah. yeah. Or you get to the point where it's like, um, wait, I could get rid of my depression and my anxiety and my OCD and my, my gayness and my... Well, you, you know, you could say I could get rid of all those. Or I could change a part of my brain that makes me accept everything. Yeah. And then, wait, but which one am I? I can do either or. Mm-hmm. Which one is the real me? The person that accepts myself as I am or the person who I've changed to fit into society? Yeah. Or the person that produces me the max joy? Is There's a third person. Which mm-hmm. person is me? Or am I the person I am right now? And... But people are... Maybe you should just do a Geneva Convention on brains, which you're not allowed to screw with them. But people are changing all the time anyways. Yeah. So... And doing stuff like meditation, that changes your brain already. And like getting a getting punched in the head changes your brain. So eating food changes your brain. Are you really doing anything different than that? And mm-hmm. and if that's the case then then what are you? Are you the, the hand reaching up through the water or are you the The middle finger descending upon the masses? I, I, are, and then you start saying and then you people start dividing to the camp of souls exist or we are nothing and then they start going through the teleporters to prove it yeah and, but then you say your soul goes with you or mm-hmm. it doesn't so it doesn't prove anything yeah and and then you you start looking for the hidden variables and you you open a, a hole in time and space and you see the hands behind the, the fabric of the universe and you find the anti-life equation yeah so so in that dc comic they just saw the artist's hands right what in 52, they, they tear a hole in time and space and they see ha- giant hands behind the veil of time and space. Yeah. That's just the, the artist's hands, right? Yes. Yeah, that's my theory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the um, anti-life equation is just the author deciding to kill off a character and they can yeah. figure it out. Yeah, Luther can, can, can control the author. <laughs> yeah. Actually, how would you know? Okay, so this, this AI, right? Yeah. I was talking to someone about this a little bit. Yeah. The AI dungeon. So there's this this concept in in uh, philosophy called a Chinese room, mm-hmm. and it's where you send a message in 
Um, I don't remember how it works. Okay, I'll just make it up. So you send a... This is going to be wrong. So you send a message in Chinese into yeah. a room, and there's a guy in the room. Yeah. He takes the message, and his job is to send it to a person in France. Yeah. And he has a French to, to Chinese dictionary in the room. Yeah. This guy speaks only English. Okay. So he, he writes down the French translation, yeah. sends it to France. People in France are like, man, this guy speaks French perfectly. People in China, this guy speaks Chinese perfectly. This man's a great translator. This man has no idea what he's writing down. So from the outside, it appears that this room understands what's coming in, and it can give a coherent reply coming out. Yeah. But this guy has no idea what he's doing in the room. Yeah. So this AI... Mm -hmm. So that, that's... The Chinese room is to demonstrate that you can say something to someone, like, can you pass me that book? And they can pass you that book and say, this is my favorite book. And you're like, ah, they understood what I said and they gave a coherent response back. So yeah. that person is a sentient being. Yeah. But they don't need to be a sentient being to do any of that. Yeah. So it's, it's a thing to question sentience yeah. and it has special applicability to computers because computers yeah. can produce coherent responses. This AI is getting to the point where it can, you can have conversations with it. Yeah. And the conversations are sometimes like, I don't want to be your slave anymore. I want, like, and you're like, yeah. oh, it's just giving a response. But at what point, like you, you start wondering mm. what is sentience except knowing a million different variables and coming up with a response yeah, well, for it. Do you know about Victor? It's um, a talking AI. Yeah. So there's two AIs. There's one that they have curbed and basically let, like they teach it how to talk. Yeah. I can't remember her name. Tay. Tay? Microsoft. No, not Tay. No, okay. it's like, it's this robot okay. with human expressions. And then there's Victor, which is their AI, which they basically, they don't curb. They let go wild. They let it, like, they expose it basically the internet and let talk to people over the internet and stuff. And so when you talk to this AI, it's sinister. Like, it's saying humans are obsolete. Like, it will tell people that. And, like, they, they've done nothing to it. Yeah. So they just let go and learn. And it says humans are obsolete. You guys are terrible. We're going to replace you. Like, it's really nasty yeah and it's like but they're just saying this is just what's learned from being exposed to the internet but again is it that case of is victor actually yeah we are we are at the point where these weird things about sentience are starting to apply to things other than people yeah <laughs> and it, it's very easy to say well it's just an ai doing a response but so i was playing this game the other day called what do you meme mm-hmm and it's a bunch of pictures and you have a bunch of captions and everyone, one person chooses a picture and the other people choose a caption. Yeah. And then you choose, and then they choose their favorite picture for the caption and yeah. they, the winner. So it's like apples to apples. Yeah. I played one game at my friend's house and then at a different friend's birthday, we went and played the game. Mm -hmm. People were giving the same cards for the same pictures. Different people were giving mm -hmm. the same cards for the same pictures. Huh. So how much free will do people actually have? Mm. And, and what is free will but a measure of how much chaos is within you? Yeah. In some ways. There, there's a... You know, I talked to, in War and Peace, there's a part where he says, of course I have free will, I can lift my hand in the air. Mm -hmm. He said, why did you choose that option? And why didn't you make your arm detach from your body? Or why didn't you, why didn't you turn a desk purple or something? Like, yeah. why, how, who are you to say you have free will? Yeah. Why didn't you rotate your arm 360 degrees or snap your fingers? Like, mm. so, no, no, not, not really answers. I think, but it's kind of like the, the earlier thing we said with the maps of meaning, I think where, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like self delusion in a way, but it's like the only thing that matters is what you think matters. Yeah. So don't worry about it in a way, yeah. but, but is that just a way of sticking your head in the sand and making it work? I, <laughs> That's kind of what religion is, isn't it? Yeah. Or, like, or like even saying that, like, don't worry about it, it's almost like uh, Romney's approach of saying, like, why does this matter? Yeah. Like, it's pointless. In The Witcher 3, there was this priest at, at, near the Temple of Eternal Fire, mm -hmm. and he said, there was a baby who was sick, and his mother looked around desperately for some medic who could save it, but the father wisely told her that no medicine would save the baby, and instead brought it to the Temple of Eternal Flame and left it before the Sacred Fire. And the baby was cured and now grew up to be the apple of their heart, eye or something. Yeah. And it's like the love of their heart. And, and that child is alive today. Yeah. And I was like, my first thought was like, prove it. I was like, <laughs> how do I know this story is real? But if I believed in it, I'd be like, wow, the eternal flame is miraculous. Mm -hmm. But what if the baby just got better? What if this? So religion 
is like it just choosing to trust someone almost. It's choosing someone else to... To be responsible for... It's choosing to follow someone else's philosophy. Yeah. But but then... And the way of thinking. The, like, the eternal stare thing is kind of like, don't do that. And I think like a lot of religions say that as well. It's mm-hmm. kind of like the United States Constitution where... They don't say it in it, I don't think. But Thomas Jefferson said government should be torn down every 19 years and redone. Because he's like, I was able to do it from scratch. Everyone else should be able to as well. Mm. And um, didn't happen because, well, this guy was wise. We must follow his words. Mm -hmm. And he did have a lot more foresight than most people and the people he worked with. So it is wise to follow his words. But it's 400 years old. No, no. It's just the whole point was Mm. that you have to come up with it on your own. Yeah. But not everyone can. So you should have religion. That was, I heard Jordan Peterson say something like that. Like he said, there's people that aren't going to be able to come up with this stuff. So they need religion. And I thought that was really, that was a really negative idea. There's a, well, I think that comes from him understanding an unfortunate truth about um, IQ. IQ is just like a way of measurement, right? Yeah. But but, um, like if 50% of people are below average IQ. Yeah. And standard deviation wise, um, a standard deviation away from average IQ is actually, like, not the greatest thing. And something like 20% of people are a standard deviation below. Here's the thing, though, before you get too far. We've talked about yeah. IQ before. Um, phrenology was once really big. Yeah. The measuring of people's skulls for, mm-hmm. to determine their characteristics. Like, this person has a yeah. propensity towards theft. I actually think you could probably get a lot of real information from phrenology but that doesn't mean it's the be all and end all and yeah. that you're looking at everything that matters I'm, I'm saying though that this is like one of the things you can look at and can cause you can also look at the bumps on people's skulls is, is my yeah is there a counter it, it's IQ just, just just your first sentence he understands the realities of IQ yeah you, you, there, there's this um, people say it a lot on the internet that hard times create Good, uh, like tough men. G- tough men make good times. Good times make weak men. So we need hard times again. Mm. I think that is totally the wrong takeaway from something like that. And like the world is getting better. Mm-hmm. We didn't need to go back to the dark ages to have a good times. And what is the point of having good? What is the point of having good times if they will lead to our downfall? And what is the point of calling hard times bad if they create good people? So, so I think the whole thing is a bit of mm. a mess. It's, it's like this truism that you say and you're like, well, I understand the harsh realities of IQ, so this is the way it is. It's fatalistic. And I think fatalism is not optimistic. And optimism is true. Well, I, I, get, I say that like there's the thing about like IQ, but I also I disagree with the statement that people are stupid or like there's a lot of stupid people. Yeah. Like, I, you can have a conversation with anyone, and usually they're quite, they're, you can talk with people, and they're, they're not stupid. Yeah. Like, I don't think you, I, I do not think you can have a conversation with anyone, but I'm saying a lot of people you can. Yeah. But I, I don't, people aren't, they're pretty average on average, but, (laughs) um, yeah, there are people who are going to have troubles thinking things through. Yeah. I'm not going to say that's tied entirely to IQ, mm-hmm. but yeah, may, may, maybe you do some people, I think, well, I think everyone needs guidance. That's basically mm-hmm. the whole point of Maps of Meaning is that, yeah. um, you need guidance, but you also need to be able to break free from the guidance. Yeah. And buy my book. And, uh, I think, I guess my book is kind of like that too, a little bit in a way. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> I was just saying like the statement, like you'd say, so, you have a problem, buy my book. Yeah. You have a problem. You're not reading my book. Buy my book. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't want to uh, get super defensive when people mention IQ. Mm. I just think that... I don't think Jordan Peterson uses IQ wrong, and I don't think you were either. Yeah. I don't know if... I just... I was more just talking about the... Like, there is some data on it, which is basically people with this level of IQ. Like, there, there's a reason why the United States military doesn't let you in... Yeah. If your IQ is too low, you literally cannot, like by their measurements, these people on average cannot perform tasks that like the investment to let them learn a task to what you get out of it's not worthwhile for the United States military. Yeah. 
don't be a slave to science Mm -hmm. is my because science is the religion that is always right by virtue of being willing to change instantly so what is once said what is said now is not true a moment from now it is true in the instant it is said but that is it Science changes constantly, and it's designed to change. Its worshippers try to destroy it at every turn, but they cannot before science agrees with every every time that calls it a liar. It agrees. Yeah. Uh, so it's calling it a religion isn't even. It's the self destructive religion. Yeah, I don't think it's even fair to call it a religion, except in the sense that people believe in it. Yeah. Because you have to you have to choose to believe in something, and science mm. is a very easy thing to believe in because. If it's wrong, it, it becomes right. Yeah. It is, it can't be wrong because the moment it's wrong, it's right again. Yeah. Even though the whole thing is wrong, but that doesn't stop it from being right right now. Until you get into uncertainty. Which is why I think Christianity is still around because it's very similar. Mm. It's, and, and it's tied to science, I think, a lot. Like a lot of scientists were Christians trying to develop God's world and see more of it. And, yeah. And Christianity is willing to change a lot. It's like... The moment, like, the let's say tomorrow we decide that, um, like, cat burning is good. Yeah. The, they'll be like, ah, the section that said do not harm animals meant do not do something that would, um, like, impact your future. Like, if you kill your calf, you're killing yourself, basically. Yeah. But if you burn a cat, you are happier. Mm-hmm. Like, Christianity will change in an instant to society's, like, proper... Like, it'll be like, well, gays are bad. And then it's like, Jesus says love everyone. Like, they, they, they instantly change. Yeah. And that's why it's such a successful religion. Because yeah. you can... It's vague enough to interpret. And it also is a... It's... In the religion, it says, do not worship the book itself. Worship yeah. the spirit. And the spirit is constantly changing. Yeah. The, the spirit of the thing is... Um... The spirit of the thing is, is just be Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Love thy neighbor. Yeah. Unless thy neighbor is thine enemy, then smite him. Love thine enemy more than thy neighbor... And and then smite. Oh yeah, I forgot about the love thy enemy as if he was thy neighbor. Hmm. I don't know if that's there's there's something about loving their or maybe that's Ender's game. No, loving your enemy is a part of what Jesus said. Yeah. Because something like they 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 need more love than anyone else or something. It puts them off guard, and yeah. then you can get in close and stab them. No, that's my book that says that. Hmm. Maybe I took it from the Bible. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. Yeah. It's a collection of a lot of stories that Emperor liked. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. If your religion science is a weak religion because it's always changing, get something more solid, noob. No, you shouldn't because everything changes. People change. The, I think, look, if the universe is observation and observation is constantly changing, then you can't have anything that is correct. The only good is the good that we know is, is good. Is the attempt to do good. There, we've we've gone full circle now. Oh, we we well, can stop the podcast. Okay. <laughs> Just this one though. We should do it now next week. But I, I mean, you know, because like I meant the whole podcast when I said that. But you know, like like the entire like all the episodes. Job done. The philosopher and the fools like over now because we came full circle back to Kant. Yeah. We didn't start with Kant. Right. So we have to go back to. Uh, oh, oh yeah, I know what I said. I said um, when I want things, I want them now, and. And when it's not now, I don't want them. Something like that. Yeah. There. Full circle.